now, No Simple Road. How you guys doing out there? We're back with another fun-filled, glorious, magnificent, festivus episode. This week's John Kadlasek. And I went into this one really with just excited to talk to him and get to know who he is. And I think I can speak for all of us. Am I safe speaking for all of us, guys? Prob- Usually. I don't you know. Probably. We gotta say it first, and then I'll say yes or no. Do we he really have a say so in this? Collectively blew our minds. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 All right. His his outlook on music and the world we live in, and just inside of his mind, is there's a lot going on in there. This is a smart cat, and gave me a different outlook on, on his whole deal. Well, he just explained things so wonderfully. That's it. Like, I don't think that his views were so crazy out there. I think that he just has a way of explaining things that really wraps your mind around it and gets you to understand it immediately. Yeah. And honestly, most of the things he was talking about was like common sense stuff. But it was kind of like didn't realize was common sense until after he explained it. Exactly. Yeah, it was like going to a class. Melanie uh-huh. said that at the end. She no, very, very well Apple put. Apple said that. Huh? Apple said that. Yeah, it was like going to a class, and he was the professor. Yeah. And yeah. So we guys took you on a class today. Professor Kadlasik. <laughs> so all right, guys. Here's the deal. Follow us on Instagram at No Simple Road. On Instagram is where you can find out about uh, upcoming episodes, pictures of the family, all that kind of stuff. And also, since we're building this amazing little community together, um, go on there. And when you are taking pictures of stuff, hashtag no simple road. And on our website, it will show the last 20 most recent Instagram stuff. I don't know what. Like, like what? doggies. Take a picture of your doggies. <laughs> okay. And, and hashtag NSR or no simple road. Sorry. Yeah, don't say don't Not do NSR. hashtag NSR. Sorry. Or your cats if you're a cat person. Go okay. Cats yeah, are cool too. Oh, we, we do not the or your yeah. hedgehog. And yeah, or your piggies, whatever. How oh, about your pets? Oh, I forgot. Your, your, Never mind. That's a sad thing. That's I like robo podcast. hamsters. If anybody me. has a robo hamster or a finger monkey. That yeah, one. those oh, are cool too. Finger yeah. monkeys are rad. So yeah. Oops, I hit the mic. So don't touch Good the mic. Oh, God, this is hard. Doing podcasting is difficult, man. No, it's not. Stop it. Oh, I'm so exhausted <laughs> from sitting here talking. I can't. So yeah, Instagram. And then head over to nosimpleroad.com. And there is a bunch of amazing shit. So we have a merch page where you could buy stickers. And we're almost out of the original logo stickers for No Simple Road. I told you guys in the last episode that we're going to be changing the logo soon because of a big announcement. And that's where you can get those stickers on the merch page at No Simple Road. Then down at the bottom of the page is the Amazon link. You can go through that portal and bookmark it. And that way you don't got to go to our website first before you go to Amazon. You can just bookmark that portal once you go through it. And if you're going to buy stuff on Amazon, they will give us a small percentage of what you spend. And it's a way for you to support the show without spending money that you weren't normally going to spend anyway. So that's a good thing that you can do to help the family out. And then speaking of money, guys, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash no simple road. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Supporting us. Say it, Mel. What? That was it? Well, no, I won't do a big speech like I did last week about it. But I just want to say thank you to the continuing supporters and the new ones. It's really rad that you are doing that to like show your love to us and that's all i can say yep so that's patreon.com forward slash no simple road and guys listen i say it every episode we need your help you know there's costs associated with this thing and i was thinking about it while i was brushing my teeth today and like we put out four episodes a month pretty much so if you gave a buck a month that's like you paying 25 cents an episode <laughs> Yeah, it's not a lie. I think this is worth a quarter. So, you know, that's a that's thing. That's super cute. <laughs> that, that A quarters are even cuter than a dollar. It's true. Yeah. Scientifically, so, that quarters are cuter than dollars. It's true. Four times cuter, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's well, patreon.com that, forward well, slash no simple okay. road. Also, the Facebook page. Am I forgetting anything? Oh, iTunes, uh, Apple Music. Uh, YouTube. YouTube. Drop YouTube. a like and subscribe. Yeah. Google Play Music. Smash that like button. Smash that like and subscribe on YouTube. And then Apple Podcast and Google Play Music. Go on there and leave us a five-star review. I just have to say and interrupt this. Darwin's being so cute right now. 
You should see his little face. She's petting his cheeks. It's super cute. It was a way for me to distract um, Aaron from the business park because I hate it. So now I don't even know. Oh, yeah. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play Music. Leave us a review. That's a way that you can spread the word about the show and people can find out about it and we go up in the rankings and you guys are rad. Go in Uh, there and tell us about your day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the forum. Forum on the website too. On the comments. But yes, absolutely go into the forum and tell us about your day. Because now there's like three people. It's like a room with three people talking to each other. Three people talking to each other. I said I was going to put my story on. Yeah, you didn't put your story. So... Those are the things. Yeah, so okay, neither one of that episode nor this episode will be out. Or see, you got like two weeks. You're fine. <laughs> so I saw one of our listeners took a picture of the back of her car. And on her oh, window yeah. is a Grateful Dead sticker, a CRB sticker, and a No Simple Road sticker. Thanks, and thank Rosie you, Rosie. Rose. Thank you, thank you, thank you Why for that. Why did last names, man. No, that's that's not. The oh, okay, name. okay, cool. All right. That's, that's her. Name that's her, her Instagram name. All right, her Insta. Oh. So, I hope so, Rosie, that was really cool to see. That was a cool thing, like to be counted among that company on that window. Is a, it's a huge honor for me and us, and I appreciate it. So, my point in telling the story was. If you've purchased stickers or you see them out in the wild somewhere, take a picture of it, man, and hashtag no simple road so that we could see where the stickers are ending up. Because that's fucking cool, you guys, to, you know, build the community and see where everybody's at. And here's Justin's favorite part of the episode. Let's just let it happen. Thank you, Darwin. Darwin's having a drink. Oh, drink in the water. Yep. There you go, Justin. There's Darwin adding his contribution. So that's all the business stuff. It was a little disjointed and helter skelter this week because it's been a trippy weekend, yeah, and to say the week. least, and a trippy week. And there's another trippy week coming. Mm-hmm. I think another trippy I weekend. think we might be living in a trippy life. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. It's fine. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I w- what? I was going to add just one last thing because I just like to do it. And she's always on our mind. Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> and, you know, the invitation's always open. We were happy you were going to come and then you weren't. But what you're doing sounds really cool. And just know you're always on our mind and we appreciate you. Yeah. So big hug. Squeeze. All right. So, <sighs> ladies and gentlemen, without further ado. I give you the genius, the virtuoso, the magical, the mystical, the wizard of guitar, John Cadlesek. Here we go. This is going to be interesting. John Cadlesek. Hello? John. Yes. Hey, how you doing, man? Good. Is this Aaron? Yeah, this is Aaron. How's it going? Hey. All right. How you doing? I'm good, brother. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the rest of the crew that's sitting here with me, man. Uh, right here at my right hand is my wife, Melanie. Hi there, John. Good. How you doing, Melanie? I'm doing great. Super excited to talk to you today. Oh, thanks. And then over across from that's me is my, brother, is my brother, Apple. Good morning, John. Thanks for being on the show. And, Good morning. And Ryder. So hey there, you got four of us on the phone with you, man. All right. <laughs> well, hey, you know, our thing, like, we're all huge deadheads in this house, and we started this podcast kind of just telling our stories about, you know, how we got turned on to the dead and all that, and it's kind of morphed since then. It's growing, and it's becoming this thing that we started and you're a huge part of that for us man um you know your music and what you do is integral in that world and in our lives and i just got to start off by saying thank you brother thank you for what you do you know oh well my brother it's just uh i know i can't imagine uh <laughs> any other, any other path at this point? Yeah, ain't um, no place I'd rather be, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I'm curious, man. Like, I I was reading up about you, and I was reading about how you got started in music and stuff. And 
it, it wasn't the guitar that that brought you in. It was the violin, right? No, oh, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, you know, really, really, I could say that, you know, a xylophone. I mean, I I, I had uh, you know I, I taught myself to read music, you know, when I was really young, just kind of from a you know a book that came with a color coded xylophone, you know, and the, there was no notes. <laughs> so we have Fisher and, Price you know, to thank for John K. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah, to, to some degree, yeah. And, I, but, you know, I, and then by the time I was nine, I was just I was really into the sound of a of a violin, and I, I chose that. It was something I wanted to do. Wow. Uh, so. It, what was like the I mean, early? My dad would have been much happier for me to go into uh, you know management of some sort. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think was not a thing. I, I mean, think... you know, they they agreed to rent a violin for me, but uh, and eventually, uh, my grand, you know, when I grew into a, my hands grew to full size, uh, there was a family violin that was my grandfather's that I, uh, was handed down to me. But <laughs> I never got private lessons. This was all public school, my choice. <laughs> so, so your grandpa played too. Uh, yeah, I guess. My, I mean, I don't remember hearing him play, you know. <laughs> but he, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side, yeah, played violin. Not, wow, that's not professionally though. That's kind of cool. So, like, growing up, was the house filled with music all the time, or was that just something that was? Well, I mean, I mean, my dad's a city manager. And my mom is a painter. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm saying. There was no. My, I never heard my grandfather play violin. I just heard okay. about it. I got and, you. And uh, most of the time, I saw this violin. It was in pieces in a uh, in a Slovakian crib that my you know. <laughs> and at one point, they decided to you know my my grandfather decided to pay to have it repaired and shipped to me. <laughs> wow, that's kind of cool. Like you get to to play the instrument that your grandpa played, and that was kind of your entree into the world and all that. That's kind of special and cool. So, the early- I, you know, I studied classical violin. I didn't have any, uh, I didn't really have a whole lot of rock and roll in my life except for Beatles records. So, uh, you know, I had Rubber Soul through, I had Help through uh, Magical Mystery Tour, you know, that I could throw on my little, uh, you know, portable uh, <laughs> turntable with one speaker. <laughs> and what, what was the thing with Star Wars, man? Oh, the star, yeah, well, then that was the other, uh, you know, I was part of the inspiration to to, uh, uh, to pick up the violin was the soundtrack of Star Wars. So it was right there at that age, you know. You know, as a kid. <laughs> so like- I had that double, yeah, I had, that was my other record, you know, I had a double record as a soundtrack, and I just played that to death. As a kid, that Star Wars stuff was like, I remember being so awed and blown away with the music from that, too. Like, it was such a grand yeah. thing. I could see how that could move you to want to play. Well, pro- probably my first attempt to play a, uh, a cover song from, from the 20th century would have been uh, like grade school music trying to do the Star Wars theme with a, <laughs> with a piano player, a friend of mine. That's badass. That's really cool. It was a catastrophe, but... <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it the first try always a catastrophe? You know, come on, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so, you uh, know... You know that's, that was the first attempt to collaborate on a music project, you know, with just some up here, you know, as opposed to uh, participating in, a, you know, an orchestra or whatever. <laughs> it, it's too bad we don't have a recording of that. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I'm always curious, like when I get to talk to people that have inspired me that are also deadheads, like I know my first experience with the dead was life altering to say the least. Um, and y- you've taken it so far, man. Like what was your, your first show, like your first experience in the dead world? Uh, well, I tried to go see a show in uh, the summer of 88 uh, at Alpine Valley. And I drove up there, and it was the day off. <laughs> okay. they, were in like a, they were in like two nights and a day off and two nights or something like that. And, uh, and at that point, you know, at Alpine Valley, you know, camp, you know, parking was free and camping overnight was permitted in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. You could just, just go up and camp with the hippies, but, you know, I, I, I walked around... Uh, you know, I mean, there were there were thousands of people, thousands of cars. I don't know how many thousands of people just hanging out on the day off. Um, 
and I walked around and heard a, a, a live sitar played by somebody for the first time in my life. I had a, you know, a, that was sort of another thing I acquired from being a Beatles, <laughs> a little Beatles freak was, uh, you know, George, George Harrison sitar work all over those Beatles records. And, nice. Um, so like to finally hear one live was, you know, you know, I, for that adventure it was at least worth the drive up. <laughs> yeah. But then I finally got to see uh I finally got to see a show in the spring of eighty nine at Rosemont Horizon. Um, you know, and at that point I you know, I I was kinda already, you know, looking for the next thing after rock and roll. I mean, this is the late eighties, uh, you know. Right. Um I'd uh you know, I had been you know I've been in three or four bands at this point, all of which tried, you know, which played, you know, tried to write original music in addition to playing covers. And, uh, um, yeah, then I, uh, I taught myself multi-track recording, you know, I was renting studio equipment to record demos of original songs in my bedroom in high school. So, right. um, they were terrible songs. You'll never hear them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. Totally. Um, yeah. It seems and, like you were uh, ambitious, you know, so John. Like, uh, I was kind of, well, I, I guess I, I was kind of an autodidact, which means I have like an OCD about learning. Mm. So like as soon as I burned through the official material, the, the next thing available was trying to figure out how a teacher was teaching us. And, you know, once, once you're there, then you're teaching yourself, you know. And it was just like devour everything from... Uh, you know, computer programming to, uh, you know, to, to music, to model rocketry, to, you know, uh, you know, wilderness camping, to... <laughs> <laughs> anything uh, I can get my whatever. hands on. Yeah, totally. But that, right. that first but, uh, show... You know, music was a big piece for certain. Yeah, that first show, I mean, um, that for me, like I said before, was life altering like it was a game changer when you left your first show did you like was it different for you after that were you like okay this is the thing this is where I'm going like uh, well I mean I, I was actually kind of heading that way I was already kind of looking for you know I, I had kind of heard uh, you know there were a few bands sort of doing um, following in the footsteps it wasn't we didn't have the jam band term yet which I kind of hate anyway but uh, um but, you know, Edie Raquel and the New Bohemians, I think, were, uh, you know, a clear, you know, I think the first, you know, modern era jam band, actually. Yeah. Um, it's too bad what happened to the record label crushed them, but, uh, uh, but, uh, I didn't, I had no idea about that. You know, I was kind of looking, you know, I was kind of looking for, you know, the next thing. I was, you know, I was reading, uh, Alan Watts and Carlos Castaneda and, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, and I was kind of like wanting to, uh, like, you know, come up with a new age rock and roll or a Zen rock and roll or something like that, you know. Um, you know, rock and roll with a little more, you know, with all the grit and dirtiness, but, you know, musically uh, and energy, but without necessarily uh, caving so hard on just, uh, you know, simplistic lyrics or. <laughs> yeah, and trying to find um, the thing that's, that's you know, then, pure, too. Right. And, you know, and I was like 18 trying to figure this out, so my sense of poetic, you know, uh, uh, relevance was relatively undeveloped, you know, so it was great to come to the Grateful Dead and see how they worked, you know, uh, uh, ancient storytelling archetypes together with, you know, like early 20th century references that are actually timeless, Right. It's interesting to look at song, to look at songs and see where they, um, you know, for for sort of cultural touchstone references, you know, because those things disappear and fade away, you know, or be, they they don't make songs identify with an era and become passe. But the dead, you know, went right for like 1920s stuff that was sort of already passe and made it relevant again. Right. Or or 1800s stuff, or you know, or 1500s. You know, they, they, you know, some of the storytelling goes way, way back that they that they draw from. Yeah, you take a song like uh, Peggy so, O. And, and, yeah, that's old school. Well, that's a that's a folk song. Yeah, I mean that's just a straight up folk song. But Lady with a Fan, 
you know, it draws from uh, an old song called The Lady of Carlisle, uh, really? for example, or Stagger Lee, or, uh, you know, I mean, these are true, you know, Hunter, uh, Hunter didn't write Peggio. Peggio has been recorded by hundreds of people over hundreds of years, you know? Right. Um, and, you know, and people still argue on when they write set lists, whether it should be Peggio or Scenario. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think but, that uh, those, you know, those... So, and that's, that's sort of a thing, like, like that kind of folk thing is part of the folk tradition, you know, to take these songs, you know, nobody owns them and, uh, and you can modify them a little bit and make them yours. Whereas like, what you know, and, the uh, Grateful Dead had a lot of integrity in that department, you know, but they're just a Led Zeppelin who took songs, who treated songs that were actual songs by, you know, African American musicians and, and then treated it like folk songs that they could just rearrange the words and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but you know whatever. <laughs> but hey, you got everybody does their thing, man. You know, I guess that's one yeah. thing that I've and learned then, in this and world. And Led Zeppelin is definitely and it's definitely well documented. Uh, you know, Led Zeppelin's offenses in that regard. <laughs> They're kind of unabashed when it's it comes not to like that. I'm yeah. surprising anybody here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, they, they have that, the dead had that, or have that knack that they take those things and, like you said, make them relevant again. And uh, as a, well, as, they, go ahead. They, under, they understood the folk, what that folk lineage is about. And it's not about acoustic instruments. It's not about, like, you know, the Kingston Trio. So the, the tradition of folk music is about writing songs that are real, regardless of whether they sell or not. It's about writing music for grown-up adults that have experienced real life and not just 13-year-old girls. You know? um, and that's really what folk music is about. It's, you know, I've never uh, heard it explained Dylan, like that. You know, that's, that's the real aesthetic of folk music, is, is that it's music for folk as opposed to music to be sold. So do you think and, that's why it uh, becomes so personal to us? That, that like, you can... I've heard dead songs for 30 years and they change and morph and, and change with my experience and become personal in different ways and that I think that might be why I've never heard that before well, that's, that's a piece of it it's, it's definitely that they were you know that they were in touch with uh, you know with how music is a you know a thing that uh, humans have had a relationship with for thousands of years and they're this thing happened in the 20th century where all of a sudden it could be packaged onto a piece of plastic and sold and lots of money could be made. And there were hit songs before that, but you know, hit songs, the way a hit, a hit song happened in 1850 is it was sheet music. Right. And the only way you heard it was because someone at the local saloon could play it on the piano. There was no play, but there, but there were still hit songs, you know? Right. Um, so like for that, for, you know, that's a huge shift that happened in the early, early 20th century. And it happened right at a time when, uh, you know, when macro capitalism was happening also, and it latched onto it and, it, uh, uh, and invented demographic studies in order to figure out that the people who had the most money to spend on music were 13 year old, 13, 15 year old girls. So somewhere in the fifties became the business model of dialing in all music, music merch for 13 to 15 year old girls. And so the folk music is a bit of a, of a reaction to that, you know, of being like, what, wait a minute. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, you know, so there became this massive propaganda campaign that, you know, just subliminally leaked in through everything of last year's music is passe, your older brother and sister's music is passe, you definitely shouldn't listen to your parents' music, and your grandpa's music is right out, forget it. You know, whereas it used to be like, grandpa knows the best shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. You know? Wow. Right? He totally. And, uh, you know, somehow, and, and then Grateful Dead were kind of, the, you know, in 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 my estimation, one of the, you know, uh, a principal force in trying to preserve a, a, a bigger sense of humanity's relationship to music in general. <laughs> it's well, a I, vital I uh, think force. And the, they, they the, built their business model more on, um, on a, uh, the, on a um, utility model, the way you would run a utility rather than the way you would run a Walmart. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? So just the... Um, the mix of psychedelics coming in, you know, breaking out in the 60s, you're talking about this subliminal model. Uh, 
of, you know, selling to 13 year old girls and how last year's passe now and all that, like when psychedelics came onto the scene, I think, I think it freed people of that to some extent and opened everything up again. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a, that was a big component of it. And not just for music, but for everything. Right. Of sort of seeing through the whole, um, uh, advertising driven, uh, consumer economy, <laughs> right. you know, which is the beginning of the matrix. If you understand that metaphor at all, Absolutely. Uh, the matrix movies are, uh, are a metaphor for, uh, you know, being a, a citizen in a consumer based economy. You used to sleep in a pod, you know, sending oh, a battery for a bigger machine. You know? Yeah. And they're sucking off your fear and your, your power to power yeah. this machine yeah. that's running. And, you know, like uh, it's if waking up into coming out of the matrix, out of the construct. And that was my entree, like psychedelics and going to a dead show woke me up. It showed me yeah. what was going on. I was like, Oh shit, what do I do now? Kind of thing. And <laughs> the, the music yeah. taught me how to live again and taught me how to be a person. And, and find my ground and find my center. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, you know, that that was supplemental for me in a, in a, in a very tangible way, but I think I'd already, uh, you know, again, kind of coming back to the autodidact thing, I'd applied that to looking at our, at our, at our culture and our society and kind of, you know, and figured out even before pot and acid that, uh, that, that, you know, making a big pile of money wasn't where it was at. <laughs> and I certainly, you know, I certainly could have chosen a career path, uh, you know, uh, any number of reliable, safe bets, but I kind of decided that, uh, that being a, um, you know, a DIY musician also put every skill I had in play, you know. Thank you for doing um, that. Sorry, you know, and, and that making less money meant making, meant, Putting less money into bomb purchases. <laughs> wow! You know, I, I, I got yes. tapped into that that essential component of the counterculture early, you know, even before I got into the dead or pot or acid. Um, wow! But this is the case we made that that the, uh, I think sixteen, seventeen. I was somewhere in there. I was on a track, honestly, at one point to go to West Point. <laughs> oh shit! Well, I'm glad you didn't. And just kind of was like, um, you know, no. <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. That's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I, oh. <laughs> wow. You, John, you're kind of blowing my mind right now. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah I'm because, at a loss. because we haven't even really talked about your music, and now, honestly, I'm not interested. I want you to keep talking about what you're talking about. Oh, uh, well. Wow. <laughs> like, you just seem thing. like so much more than that guitar right now. I don't know. I, I tell you, man. I, Wait a minute. Do, do people really talk to you about other stuff? Like, when you do interviews, like, do people really get to this a different part of your, you know, life? Uh, well, well, this my relationship to uh, to uh, to folk music and uh, and it's and the Grateful Dead being you know and Bob Dylan and the band being like the core um, pioneers of launching that into electric, taking that artistic aesthetic and and going ahead and diving into the machine, trying to see what you can do anyway. Uh, it has been a core, yeah, definitely. Like core point for me for a long time but uh, you know it, it could spin off in different directions all the time I'm not really familiar with the podcast format so much so and I tend to be uh, a little bit rambling and tangential I, I love good. it that's <laughs> us man that's our deal that, that's what a podcast is a bunch of rambling <laughs> Look, I, I don't know if, what Deadheads are good at, but one thing we're good at is rambling and being tangential. And telling so, stories. Yeah. And thanks for sharing your stories, because I, I know I'm interested. So a bunch of people will definitely be interested in hearing your 16-year-old self. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, I, my thing is just getting to know you, man. Like, I, Being a, a, a quote-unquote fan of something is a strange thing, because, you know, you... 
you kind of are letting a wall down and you let people you don't know into your life and the that music and, and, the, and their words shape you and change you. You know what I mean? So for us, like wow. this just started as us hanging out on the porch and having these conversations with each other about psychedelics and music and life and everything and has changed into what we're doing right now and finding out you know what makes people tick and it's helping us to like create this tapestry of you know putting together the loose threads and figuring out where we are and who we are you know well yeah well i'd say like you know an, uh, an essential uh, uh informative piece for me uh you know about the early san francisco music scene uh, it was actually a um Uh, a book um, Ralph Gleason wrote in uh, 1969 called Jefferson Airplane and the San Francisco Sound and it, and it talks it focuses in on uh, um, the family dog and um, Chet Helms okay who was kind of like you know he was like the, the focalizer of the family dog which was a, you know like a a production company in San Francisco. They were like a, um, but they were like the, they were the hippie production company. You know, the Bill Brown Presents would be the, uh, you know, the uh, entertainment industry production company. And Bill Brown was, you know, as uh, as music guys go, was a, was a great dude. <laughs> right. But Chet Helms was a, was a hippie guy and a counterculture guy and a, and a beatnik. And, uh, mm. and those bands, you know, including the Grateful Dead, the Jefferson Airplane, uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company, um, mm -hmm. the, the Great Society, which is sort of a precursor to uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, were, were bands that regarded their what they were doing, their artistic collaboration, as sort of like a psychic spaceship that they were making. You know, that would right. just that would bring you know energy into the physical plane. Do you do that they in your just, music? You know, they weren't just guys going, "Let's make some records and make some money." They're guys that were like. Ooh, let's change the world, <laughs> you know. Yep. And, you know, using art. <laughs> totally. And, uh, and it's interesting to get that. You know, that, that's kind of a hard to find book these days, but uh, uh, but I consider it a cornerstone in my understanding of um, of the San Francisco scene in the in the sixties. Well, that that whole thing has has birthed this music that we all love and listen to. And there's, you know, at, at one point it was the San Francisco sound and whatever that meant. And it's so much more now. And I always say the the cat's out of the bag. Like it, it's on the words on the street. It is changing. We are changing the world when, when we go to shows and, and we do that weird thing that we all do together, those ripples and vibrations go out and are healing to what's going on out there. Wow. Well, that's, that's been the, uh, you know, the, uh, honestly, music had a few different forms where it was a group dance thing going back in time, but usually before electricity, it involved drums. Right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, the, and uh, other, other forms didn't have so much. Well, there was country, certainly country dances. But country dances are a little bit more um, sort of like what, what line dances became. It was a little bit of a societal structure to, to get the young boys and girls together and so, you know, and mix them up enough that they could all figure out who, who uh, lit sparks for each other. Um, and it was just sort of part about uh, the you know, survival of the pack, <laughs> you know, producing right. the next round of, of uh, human beings. Uh, but uh, in... Uh, you know, in, in African drumming, and you know, it, it sort of evolved into, uh, you know, a Telekuti style, uh, you know, Afro funk. You know, it was much more about people getting sort of in touch with their personal muse and dancing as a way to, you know, as a way to heal and a way to, uh, to access altered states. Right. Um, and that's definitely one of the things we get, you know. Uh, another big piece we get with Grateful Dead music is they, they incorporated that thread into their to the experience. And I think that's kind of part of what the what the Family Dog was about because uh, at the time the Family Dog began, like dancing, if you didn't have a permit 
for a dance concert. Dancing wasn't allowed. What? In San Francisco. You know? And so, like, they were, you know, they, they, that's what they talk about, you know, the Grateful Dead, you know, or the Warlocks playing at Magoo's Pizza Parlor or something, because it was a place that sort of, like, fell through the cracks as far as the regulation of that went. But the Family Dog were, and those and those core bands were also instrumental in sort of bringing, bringing back to America the notion of just dancing on your own. I mean, if you went to a show in, you know, if, if you went to go see Elvis Presley in 1957, you twirled on your own in the back. They were they were calling the, you know, call the cops, the, psychi- the, the, the <laughs> psychiatrist out to wrap you up and take you away. You right. know, it was like, what the hell are you doing back there? You know, like how dare to, you to move? make that a because a, a central piece of enjoying music. And now it's no big deal. You can go to see anything from Motley Crue to to the new new Christy Mitchells, and if you stand up and dance, you know it's no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I think. But that, they did that, and that's the thing they don't get a whole lot of credit for. That's another thing I like to come back to. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think that we're missing we're missing ritual as a, as a culture, and a lot of the ritual that we have. We, in society today is television and being programmed by media and this thing that when we go to concerts that's for me and my family here man that that's our ritual time that's our time to dance and get out of our head and get out of our own way and and experience reality you know because the windows get dirty yeah the television tickles that thing in us that remembers staring at a campfire, you know, six thousand years ago. <laughs> but it, it, you know, but it just tickles it enough to keep you, you know, sucked in. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Well, and instead of seeing the visions that you would see in the fire, you're seeing these visions that they want you to see. These projections. Right. It, exactly. Like stealing your authentic connection to have your own visionary experience and substituting it with, you know, their you know, meme Your and agenda. advertising driven, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> is, you know, making a profit for shareholders. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we can do what we do and I guess kind of working yeah. from the inside of that thing. And that's beautiful in my book. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, they think they're going to make money on the concert and maybe they will, but guess what? We're going to pour out a whole bunch of beautiful energy that's going to push that back a little mm-hmm. bit and maybe there's 10 people in the audience that are going to their eyes are going to pop open that night you never know yeah absolutely you know I, since we're in this cool. vein, vein of conversation <laughs> I so I saw you I've seen you a couple times but the time that I remember the most was in Vegas at the Brooklyn it, Bowl is Oh, okay. Brooklyn the, Bowl. Yeah, the Brooklyn Bowl in Vegas. And one of the things that struck me about you, bro, was you were hanging out at the merch table and and you were out in the crowd with everybody and, and so accessible with you. There wasn't that wall of like artist and fan. You were just out there with us. And man, it really changed the game as far as the way I felt the music that night. I completely. And let, let me interject for a second because Aaron was saying where I was going to kind of take it. Uh, to, I'm, I'm looking at it now. 2013, you played. Aaron saw you, like you just said, and he came to me. We'd both kind of put in. We always listen to the Grateful Dead, but we'd kind of put that life on hold since Jerry had passed. And Aaron comes to me and mm-hmm. is like, dude, you have to go see this band with me. You have to go see further. And he took the whole family, Melanie, and you're also responsible for turning their 18 year old daughter at the time onto the Grateful Dead because we all came and saw you at the Pearl. And from the moment you opened up with Here Comes Sunshine, and just I'm looking at the set list now and it's bringing back like chills, you know, the goosebumps. And you're very influential in bringing me back into this scene. And I just wanted to thank you for that. And also their daughter, when she's a huge Beatles fan. And second set, you came out and did Here Comes the Sun. And you taught me how to dance again. Grateful Dead taught me how to dance when I was into Slayer and Metallica back in the (laughs) 80s. (laughs) 
Yeah. Once yeah. I went to a dead show that, you know, then it was like, oh, I learned to dance. I learned to live. And then you brought that back for me. And that's, I just want to throw that out and say thank you so much. And their daughter. <laughs> and and me too. That was my wow. and That was Ryder. Yeah, that was Ryder, who's Aaron's and, nephew. And that was his ever first since show. since that day, I, I've been hooked. And it was because of you. So thank you. <clears throat> No, well, the, you know, the, when, that was a big piece for me, uh, seeing the Grateful Dead for the first time was just, uh, you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't really found a music that I could cut loose and relax, uh, and be myself dancing, you know, since seeing Bluegrass and Bluegrasses and Smoky Mountains, you know, again, as uh, really young, but I didn't get a whole lot of exposure to that outside of the occasional summer visits to my, you know, to that <laughs> the grandparents that actually lived in the North Carolina area. So. But, uh, and then, then kind of coming back to, yeah, you know, and seeing the dance, I'm like, wow, just everybody's dancing. <laughs> everybody's dancing. Yeah. yeah, and it's good, you know. And it's, and no one, you know, there's no, you know, there's no, like, <laughs> no one's doing their moves. <laughs> no one's trying to, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever. Everyone's just kind of being themselves. And it was, you know, that was definitely a life changing uh, experience for me and it's what I like to you know keep in touch with when I play you know Grateful Dead music so being being adept and that's at, what I like to keep in touch with playing any music actually <laughs> yeah and being being adept at playing an instrument there's a level of muscle memory that you reach as a professional I would imagine where it becomes automatic at some point and do you ever like because I know I feel like this watching you play does it ever feel like channeling to you? Well, it's not. It's not like automatic, like the way your signature is automatic. It's more like automatic, like hitting the brakes and the gas at the right time, and the steering wheel on a car automatic. You know, it's still all okay. reacting to the moment. Automatic. It's not running through the routine. Automatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I was just saying, like, did, that, does it ever, you know, does it ever feel like something's coming through, you know, like it's, it's taken over? Uh, well, uh, the connection to the, the connection to the muse is, is something I've thought for a long time. I mean, my, I, I, when I studied classical violin, it was, uh, you know, it was all just playing the notes that were there in front of you. And there's, there's inter room to interpret in the dynamic, you know, how loud to quiet and quiet to loud and the speed and depth of your vibrato and the intensity of how you bite, bite into certain notes and things like that. But, um, but I definitely was, was, uh, wanting to know about improvisation and my, uh, the, the resources available to me through violin were hitting a dead end. I picked up guitar to kind of, uh, to learn about improvisation. And, you know, I, I, you know, first it was just that muscle memory thing of like, okay, putting these, this, you know, learning, you know, and chords was the initial mystery of guitar for me. Uh, as a violinist, I could, you know, I had memorized the entire first violin part of the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, let's say, as well as a half dozen other similarly complex pieces, you know, and those are strings of indi individual notes, but uh, actually, I was a little intimidated by multiple notes at the same time. <laughs> so that was kind of my initial tackle, and that was the muscle kind of technique thing you're talking about. But then, I, you know, the drive was about improvisation, and uh, and I would I'd learn these licks. Okay, here's a lick. Okay, here's a blues lick. I'm learning them out of a book, whatever. And, I, and then basically, it was getting in, you know, into my first jam session with a drummer and a bass player. And let's just do some, you know, I'm like, all right, well, let's do some three chord blues, I guess. And all of a sudden, bam, that's when the, that's where the muse shows up. Oh, shit. And like all of a sudden the muse is telling me how to string these different licks together and deconstruct them and turn them in, you know, and hang them on, an, on a melody, you know, like the licks are, are like the little, you know, the licks you learn are just like the, the ornaments, you know, oh, wow. that you put. Uh, in a drawing, but then there's a subject matter that you're always trying to, to come up with. And, you know, when you do a painting, it's like, what's the, what's the subject? And then you're, there's your ornamentations and those are your styles. So it's, maybe it's blues or it's country, it's whatever. But, wow. you know, the point is to always have a subject to say, you know, that it isn't just the, uh, uh, to, to play about or sing about or 
make notes about <laughs> fine melodies. Those are the melodies, you know. And the melodies themselves are simple and they come through any instrument. I mean, sing it, play it on the piano, play it on the guitar, or whatever. Then there's the, you know, when people talk about, you know, the Garcia licks, that's like the dressing that melody up with some some ornamentations that in, uh, infuse it with energy. And that actually kind of comes from um, Hindustani classical, uh, classical Indian music. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, ragas, you know, that, that genre or that tradition, lineage, uh, didn't have chord changes, but they had mastered um, how to infuse a melody with a quality using licks, you know. So, uh, you know, the different ragas would, you know, would work better at just certain times of day, you know. They'd be like, you, you only use these licks at sunset, <laughs> you know, because yeah. that's when they really have power. And these are things they figured out over hundreds and hundreds of years. And, um, and you know, that's part of what comes into the electric guitar world, I, I think, is, is a neat thing that the, the electric guitar, I think on violin has it too, certainly, you know, uh, listen to someone like Stefan Grappelli or, um, um, uh, I don't know, I'm blanking on, uh, Old Man Away, um, um, David Grossman? Actually, it's a pleasure to oh. meet, um, Vester Clemens. Oh, okay. Um, you know, where they have, you know, you can hear, you know, and Jerry had that too, clearly, you know, there's licks you can identify, but he also had, he was also, you know, he's hanging those licks on something. He wasn't just regurgitating them. He was hanging those licks on, that's the muse. It shows up, it gives a real melody. Or it doesn't, and then you have, and then, you know, because <laughs> the muse is fickle. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's where you have a nice, like, you know, improvisational musicians also develop a bag of tricks. But it's like, you know, some guys that never get beyond the bag of tricks. <laughs> well, it's it's strange to, to hear you say that. I hang it on. It's supposed to look for something else to hang them on. Yeah, I never I never thought about that. Like, so. that a, a, a lick could have be infused with an energetic signature. It could have an emotional quality. Too, yeah. A really specific emotional quality, you know. Or it could just be something that, you know, you want the melody supposed to go up a couple notes there and you find an interesting way to get there other than just the obvious simple go to that note. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. You, you know, the licks serve as like, uh, like little over, you know, erector set modules that that stand in for parts of your, you know, your, the, the melody that the muse gives you. It's, it, <laughs> or doesn't. <laughs> it's so it's such a trip to to hear it come from you that way because you know we don't get to experience the inside of your mind so to speak while you're playing like that <laughs> and to hear it that way gives me personally a different perspective on what's happening to me while I'm listening and then <laughs> so do you find that the the crowd the energy of the crowd makes a difference in the quality of what's coming out of you? I don't know about the, well, the quality, I mean, depending on what you mean by quality, uh, it's the, certainly quality the in, a, the in, a general, in a general term. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why I, that's why I go out, you know, as well as obviously the musicians I'm playing with. So right. you get it, you get it. It's almost... <laughs> It's almost like the psychedelic experience thing too, in a in a in a laboratory kind of way, where you have um, you know, you have your known factors, the musicians you're playing with, although they always bring random elements every day, and you have the unknown factor of the uh, the uh, physical environment, you know, setting up in the room, and then the people that show up. Yeah. So. Uh, wow. I. You, so you're, you're playing here in Portland tomorrow night, right? Yeah. Well, that, that's what I was just going to I was going to add, yeah. see you've been uh, running around Oregon. We moved up here to Portland about two years ago from Las Vegas, and we have just fallen in yeah. love with this place. It's changed our lives. It's made us healthier. Just wondering if you're enjoying, you were in Bend, Eugene, now you're going to be here to, tomorrow night. How are you enjoying Oregon? Oh, I love Oregon. Yeah, and uh, I uh, my 
I have a, a, a sweetie with a homestead out here. Oh, my, right on. My uh, sweetie, my sweetie, who uh, who uh, reconnected with after a couple of decades. <laughs> oh, that's cool, man. Uh, it turns out to uh, so I'm having a good excuse to come out here a lot more often. Well, we're, we get the benefit and, uh, of that uh, too. We actually. <laughs> <laughs> So just to keep an eye, it was just to keep an eye on the homestead. So it's like, yeah, okay, we come out here on time, book some shows, and uh, and as it was, this was kind of a hard area to try and get to regularly before it's, uh, you know, San Francisco gigs pop up all the time, and I just fly in and do them, you know. But it doesn't allow for driving, you know. It doesn't make it easy to drive up this way, yeah, to at shows. Um, so this has been a cool. Uh, uh, there's a thing. Beautiful development. Yeah, there's a there's a thing up here, man. I, I tell you, the, the the flavor up here is a lot different. Like we, uh, not last night, but the night before, went and saw Phil and Terrapin Family Band here. And uh, how was that, dude? I'm gonna tell you something, man. Excellent. It was it was amazing. I, it's I've seen a lot of shows. That's in my top three f- favorite shows I've ever seen. They wow. they brought the wow. house down. They came out and tore the roof off Crystal Ballroom. That place exploded. And it, it, this, the Portland family, the Grateful Dead family here in Portland has a particular and peculiar energy that is different than anywhere I've ever experienced a show. Hmm. It's this, I don't know, this forest dwelling, foot stomping, we just came out of the woods energy that is just badass, man. So it was incredible. And <clears throat> to see Eric Krasno with them was great. We just got to talk to him a few weeks ago. So seeing him, you know, in person and then getting to experience the music was amazing. And, and I was just blown away. Never really had heard uh, Elliot Peck join them singing. It was just oh. amazing. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you do you find that like from town to town, coast to coast is because I know when I was on tour in the 90s, there's a difference between an East Coast and a West Coast show in the quality of the feeling. Oh, absolutely. And Midwest and yeah. Southeast and Texas, Southwest, they all got different, different uh, flavors, the Rockies. Yeah. Yep. So we've had a chance to like peek inside of that mind that of yours. And I'm curious, what do you, what do you see like happening for the future, man, for, for, for the music and, and what you're doing? Um, well, I, I'm hoping to just, uh, you know, write some more tunes and keep playing, uh, the music, uh, you know, it's just hard to make predictions about where, right. you know, yeah. where things are going. It's, uh, but, you know, I, I, I consider, uh, you know, it's, it's been said by many that, the you know, the Grateful Dead are, uh, you know, are sort of woven into the tapestry of, of, uh, you know, the American experience and I I go so far to say it's the it's you know, it's the heart song of the American experience. You know, what what that Rainbow family uh you know, heart song is just sort of the individual you know, like a person's expression of themselves. And I, I see it as the, you know uh a core component of the you know the entire American story. <laughs> yeah, so we, I think it's going to keep going. Yeah, we um, just. I didn't... hope it doesn't uh, fall into just being uh, another uh, uh, branded consumable media thing. You know, I, I think the quality but, uh... <laughs> of it won't allow for that. And we just interviewed uh, a local mm-hmm. Grateful Dead tribute band, the Garcia Birthday Band, here in Portland a couple weeks ago, and. One of the guys in the band said, I see the Grateful Dead as the pinnacle of human evolution and experience. And that really rang my bell, like to hear it put like that. And then together <laughs> with what you just said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's Americana at its, it's purest. And it's, it's tricky, the uh, the tribute band stigma thing, because uh, it's, it's tough, because there's a good reason to, uh, to be wary 
certainly of the tribute band notion is because it kind of just feeds it, it, generally you know for most bands that uh, that you know most artists that people do tributes to the tribute band's goal is to come as close as possible to the uh, to the hit to this hit song that everybody recognizes including all you know every every little guitar lick every keyboard you know the solo yeah. note for note and um, uh, it's it's a tricky balance for people to to you know versus uh, playing in a, a you know maybe I don't know what you would call it a genre band you know like bluegrass band the thing is is to do to do a quote unquote Grateful Dead tribute right really what you're doing is the same thing a bluegrass band does or a reggae band does or a blues band or a country band which is just that you make it sound the way you, the way it should because you love it. But it isn't a note for note thing. It's just, there's, there's simple rules you follow that still allow for infinite variation and for complete improvisation of all parts. But you're following, you know, within a certain prescribed boundaries that'll, that give it a sound. You know. Yeah, the way they explained it to me was like they're playing just like any jazz trio would play from a songbook and then play those songs well, in their own know, That's an oversimplification. I, I yeah. think it's I think the better the better references are those genres like, you know, specifically bluegrass. Uh, you know, because each instrument has its own sort of family of uh of um, rhythmic licks. Right. That you can still play infinitely differently every time you play them, but it's still the mandolin part in the bluegrass song. And that's the way Grateful Dead, you know, quote unquote, you know, most tribute bands. Now, unfortunately, there's a there's a weird there's almost, I mean, in some scenes, like the Beatles scene, tribute bands are are considered gold. You know, I mean, the Beatles stopped playing live in 1966. You know, even though they're they're cranking out hits for a bunch more years. Um, yeah. So that, you know, there's no, you know, like it's a whole different world there, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas like, although your average bar, you know, kind of sports bar music room that has tribute bands, you know, it's going to be Rolling Stones or Eagles or Fleetwood Mac or whatever. You know, and it's going to be about to have their rehearse set. They figured out what songs they do best and they put them in the beginning and the end and mm-hmm. they put their hardest stuff in them, you know, and they play their set every night, you know, whereas, you know, being in a bluegrass band, you, you, you know, you're drawn from hundreds and hundreds of songs. And that Grateful Dead is similar. Yeah. Um, you know, and, the, and that with bluegrass, you can say Bill Monroe, you know, any bluegrass band is technically a Bill Monroe tribute. Except no one's trying to play, you know, play, uh, you know, the, you know, Bill Monroe's Blue Moon of Kentucky hit single, note for note. They just right. play the song in a bluegrass style. So, and that's the way, you know, it's, it's tough balance. It's uh, and, and, and in the Grateful Dead world, you have both approaches. Unfortunately, there are bands that just rec- you know there are musicians that recognize a, a good paying gig, and they're not deadheads, but they do it. Right. Um, and they tend to come. They tend to be a little more of the uh, you know that uh, the other approach. Um, you know, and then they're they're tend you know whereas deadhead bands tend to. Form. And I, I mean, I've known, I don't know if I personally know the, the um, Garcia birthday band, but I've heard about them for decades. Yeah, yeah they're, they, they um, got it. They're know, very, I know they were one of the better ones. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're amazing. And, and, and I mean, uh, starting Dark Star, was that, I mean, you went into it obviously with the intention that you're talking about, and it's, it became this thing, you know? Uh, uh, so, uh, and then, you know, and it was never, and people still think we were doing note for note following sheet music or something. And, you know, and there are guys that try and follow in our footsteps using that approach. And it's like, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> you know, we, we started out as a bunch of guys that already knew how to stretch out a jam to 45 minutes and had been playing for decades or more. And we're all people who, you know, have been playing music since, since our single digits. And, uh, wow. You know, and frankly, you know, unfortunately, like one of one of the motivations was just kind of seeing, uh, uh, you know, bands, you know, have a ringer uh, hot shot 
guitarist and uh and you know just kind of cranking out the hits for the for, you know the yuppies who had the most cash to spend on weekends oh, yeah <laughs> uh you know versus like trying to you know have some sense of of what the core inner spirit of, uh, of this the concert was about and to to realize that that's something worth trying to to achieve it's not some as a risk to keep that no one can ever touch it's absolutely worth trying to get there <laughs> it's reaching for the gold ring <laughs> down inside you never yeah. get there <laughs> if you never get there like you know the, a life of trying to get there is a lot more fulfilling <laughs> I, I would have to agree yeah. lives I could imagine <laughs> So, John, you you mentioned earlier that you didn't necessarily like that jam band uh, tag. What would you, what genre would you call it, or what? Oh, well, well, psychedelic, uh, organic, ecstatic dance music. I don't know. I guess it's a little yeah. harder. Uh, wow. I guess, you know, psychedelic rock. I guess, you know, relics, you know, relics used to be uh, music for the mind. Right. You know. Relics magazine was was shameless music for the mind. The back, you know, the the back back sections of Relics magazine had listings for deadheads that were incarcerated that you could write to, you know, oh, wow. you know, deadheads in jail looking for pen pals. Yeah, it was, was a part movie. of the Relics experience. Yeah, you know, I kind of look at jam band as a sanitization of psychedelic rock. You know, it's like people are afraid to be psychedelic rock. <laughs> So they call it jam band. Okay. But then wow. last year, then it just kind of opens it up for a lot of just, you know, good bands. I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, any, you know, like when Beyonce goes out with band, the band can jam. <laughs> right. You know, it's they're not, you know, they they know how to jam, and they do. They don't spend the whole. That's not their focus. You know, their focus is is doing what the principal sets, you know, <laughs> dances, show or whatever. But usually all those artists want to have some point where they cut loose their band and let them rock out, you know, and, and they, <laughs> you know, anybody getting that level can, you know, it's really their job to, to think that they're central thing or not. There's a clear uh, delineation between anyway, really jamming and, and magic. I mean, I mean, you, a band can jam, right. but then there's bands that are magic and, I think that's the difference that you're talking about. It sure seems okay. like it. So, Apple, yeah. what were you going to say? Yeah. I, I was going to I was going to ask one thing okay. here. Uh, we we've certainly noticed over, especially since like fairly well, kind of kicked it off more. Every time we go to shows, we're seeing a lot more of the younger crowd, like in their late teens and early twenties, that are like it seems to us like they're getting it. And, and I'm just well, wondering that's the if normal you, process. Yeah, I'm just that's wondering if you see the normal process for this crowd. music. I mean, I mean, they were kind of saying the same thing in the mid '80s, you know, where it was like, uh, you know, they're sort of saying like, what's interesting is that the uh, the uh, the age spread has gotten wider and wider as they evolve, but that the um, the average age was always like early twenties, right? Because uh, that's that's kind of the age people are, you know, the seekers are getting their freedom to go out in the world. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the seeker types, whether they go to college or go into do, or just you know, go into the world or whatever, they're you know. Um, and it's you know it's I don't know I uh, one of my one of my uh, predictions and uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can stand by this one is that when. Um, when kids, uh, when the kids that are born after the iPod drinking age, we're going to see a golden era of live music. Because for them, it, there'll be no novelty of the MP3 of having an entire library sit in the palm of your hand. It'll just be the, bad, the way it is. And I think they're going to get what's great about live music. Yeah. In a way that uh, that uh, that's been taken for granted by the you know the current generation. Yeah. You know, generation that's kind of infatuated with uh, you know with the MP3 <laughs> and streaming on your smartphone damn uh, you, you've succeeded in anyway, uh, collectively that's, that's blowing I'm our minds hoping. today anyway. <laughs> you should see hey, John you should see the looks on the faces around here man. everybody's just like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it, I feel like I've just attended a class and you were kind of a teacher it, just amazing John yeah. thank you yeah John somehow you managed um, like you know usually because you're the musician 
you know, things are going into their ears. But like today, I the way you were describing music, it was like a visual for me. So thank you for that. Because when you were explaining music earlier, just I got to see it in my mind's eye as opposed to hearing it. And that that kind of blew my mind. So I'm just grateful that, awesome. that I didn't know as much about, I didn't study up as much about you um, as I have for the other guests. And I'm really glad for that. Cause then I got to hear who you really are, which really makes me just excited to get into your music again. And come see you. Uh, well, thank you. Cause it's, it's a, it is a challenge, you know, getting into this you know, certain place where, uh, where this, you know, uh, you know, I'm definitely out there, and people are aware of me, but uh, and don't know enough uh, <laughs> yeah. to, that they just fill in the blanks with their imagination. And that's been one of the challenges, unfortunately, is, is trying to find gentle ways to um, relieve people of their misconceptions <laughs> without making them feel bad. Or, well, that's let me great. set you straight. I, <laughs> well, I hope a bunch of people that <laughs> listen to this because honestly, like. It's a, I feel like a jaw dropping kind of a thing. Like you just really let us into who you are, which that's kind of what, as at least from my personal self, like I'm interested in people and who they are, not necessarily what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Because what he does is a product of who he is. Yeah. John, we don't want to take up a lot of your time, man. I know that you're busy and you're traveling today, and we want to give you a chance to get up here so that we can come see you play tomorrow night. <laughs> cool. So, all right, well, I look forward to meeting you all. Yeah, we'll see you tomorrow I'm night, man. I can't <laughs> wait. Yeah, shake your hand. One, one last question for me. Uh, so we should we okay. expect a uh, solo Star Wars theme violin album at any time in the future? <laughs> I, uh, no, but I mean, I think John, the, John Williams, uh, you know, John Williams is, I would say, my first musical influence, 20th century musical influence. And I do think that. So there's, uh, there's a thing about, you know, the way... Uh, uh, there's a music term called uh, leitmotif. It's actually like a German word. But it's what, you know, everyone's familiar with Star Wars, how there's, you know, there's different melodies that relate to different characters or different settings. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, the Empire theme and, uh, you know, Lucas's theme and stuff like that. Well, that's, that's a great example of the kind of stuff that, that, can, that can be incorporated into live music you know, as far as like a phrase having an association with uh, an idea yeah. or a feeling or a, or a fragment of a story or an element of a narrative. Well, right on, brother. I can't wait to meet you and hear you tomorrow night. <laughs> we'll be there with bells on. <laughs> All right, man. We'll talk to you tomorrow. You have a good trip and be safe, man. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks Thank for your you, time, John. bro. All right. Peace Later. You. All right. Well, everybody, that was interesting. <laughs> that was John Kadlicek. And, um, yeah, the faces around this table right now are just kind of dumbfounded. That was really, really fucking cool, you guys. Yes. That's yeah. a genius. We just talked to a bona fide genius. That was great. I love his little giggles in between. Like, he says this completely mind-blowing thing, and then he's like... <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <It's> so, <laughs> so endearing, and... It's childlike and super grown up in like that's what I got from that interview like such an amazing like great man but still playful and psh, wow. wow yeah so I mean I'm sure that you guys listening know who he is but if you don't go listen to early Dark Star listen to some further listen to the Golden Gate Wingmen listen to Oteal and Friends He's a fucking virtuoso badass. And if you're into the dead or this whole thing, then you the owe it to yourself. And music in general. Yeah, because I know that after hearing that, I see this from a completely different perspective. Yes. So, mind blown. Uh, yep, mind blown. So what are we going to do now, guys? We're going to go eat. Watch Party. watch the I'm big gonna, game. I'm yeah. Going. Ugh. Go Ew, Eagles. Gross. I'm already bored Whatever. and it hasn't even started yet. I'm going to put on the puppy bowl. Jeremy will get it. Oh, the puppy bowl. <laughs> I'm going to watch art guy Chuck Hughes paint cabinets. Ooh, we got a friend coming over, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, follow us on Instagram. 
at No Simple Road. Go over to the website, check out the forum at nosimpleroad.com. Uh, head on over to Patreon forward slash No Simple Road and help us out. And have a good week, everybody. We'll be back next week with, I don't know, what's next week? Oh, Dark Star recap and trip report next week. Holy Nuh-uh, shit. Dark we'll Star. be recording that, but next week Nuh-uh. will be the Phil. And it, oh, yeah, 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 yeah Phil yeah, recap Phil. next week. And that's God. a really good one, you guys. I don't guys. even know what I'm talking yeah, about the anymore. Phil Wait, the Phil is, recap. The Phil recap, I think, is one of all of our favorites. After this one? But... I don't know, man. There's Just there'll be more stuff, 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 you guys. Out, yeah. Yeah, you can listen to <laughs> all the years combined. Bye. Anyway, we love you guys. Bye. I win. Nope. Damn it. You'll never win. I win. Thank you.